So recently, uh, a select few of us, my friends Tom Scott and my lady lass Hazel Hayes, got to talk to Gareth Edwards, have a chat about basically whatever we wanted to talk about. I chose to talk about um, directing and filmmaking. So I'm just letting you know that before we start this, if you don't have an interest in that, this might not be for you. But if you do, treat it like a podcast. Go and do your own thing. Listen to it. Hear what he's got to say. Hear what I've got to say if you want. I mean, I'm, I'm full of wisdom. But uh, and I'll throw to me in the past talking to Gareth Edwards about his film Ragu One. Rouge One has been done a lot. So I thought I'd come up with a new one. Hello, how's it going? I'm here today with Gareth Edwards, the director of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Um, yeah, are you happy with that poster? Um, yeah, I think it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, the, it's good, yeah. The main thing that struck me when it came out was the, the diversity of everybody. Yeah. And it was, I mean, Felicity's head's not that big in real life. Right. <laughs> she's, You've got to stop photoshopping head women's heads size. to look bigger than they are. It's ridiculous. She's very similar in size head to, to right. Diego. Yeah. But... So if you meet her, don't get scared. It's, she's mm -hmm. not a giant. Is is Darth Vader's sort of shadow constantly sort of faded behind her? It would be funny if you registered the kind of values of that little hint and see if yeah. it, it's the same amount that he's in the movie. It feels like there's some sort of mathematical <laughs> formula to it. Like, oh, that's too much. He's not in it that much. He's yeah, in it yeah, just yeah, yeah. that much. We can't much. let people there he is, believe quite, he's in it more than, than a faded amount. The legal department, like, that's how... He's in it, like, 20% yeah, yeah, opacity. Yeah. Let's start with that. I mean, everyone who's watching this has probably seen Rogue One already, but how was it to bring back s such an iconic character for like the first time in 10 years? Yeah, it was really incredible. Out of all the things that we did on the film, mm -hmm. a lot of them, everything's, you know, amazing because it's Star Wars, so you're yeah. very lucky, but some of the things become, you get used to, mm -hmm. and they become normal again. But Darth Vader can never really be normal. Yeah. And whenever we would shoot those scenes, no matter how, You'd know when he was coming on set, even though, you know... Music, you just hear it. Yeah, he always walks <laughs> with that tune. Oh, here he comes. You would, everyone's talking, it's quite noisy on a set. And then suddenly, as everyone's talking, and you go, why is everyone going quiet? <laughs> and you look, and Darth Vader is just walking into position. Yeah. And you learn that you have to take the helmet off to talk to the actor, yeah. because there you go, you can have a conversation. But mm. the second that helmet goes on, it's Darth. And there's this instant respect everyone has. No one wants to tell Darth it's what really to do. Interesting. Like it's ingrained in you. It's like God, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was interesting. And and yeah, it was. I feel very, very lucky. You know, I feel like very few people will get to film with Darth Vader in yeah. their life. Yeah, uh, uh, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, and then just to work on it in, in general, just to work on something so huge is, is, is obviously an amazing thing. Um, but what I want to focus on today is because I'm you know, a young director, a sort of up and coming filmmaker, and a lot of the people who are watching my channel, I think want to work in that sort of industry as well. So I want to sort of like okay. see how, like I want to sort of ask some stuff that I have found and see if it still carries on when you get to something of this, of this scale. Okay. The first of all being like the time you have, it feels like on low budget stuff, there's never enough time. Does that ever change when you've, you know, I mean, obviously there's so much money that's put behind this and so much support that's put behind this. Does the amount of time you have during a day and, and just overall, does that ever become not a problem anymore? Um, if we were to sit down and I was to show you like, you know, the days we had and how much we had to film in a day, mm -hmm. I think when you're doing a low budget thing, you have um, a lot less time, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't know, but maybe you'd say I had to shoot like three or four different scenes in one day, or sure. I had to shoot the whole short in mm -hmm. one day. And you'd go, look at you, Gareth, you get like, you get just one scene a day sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and you've got all these people helping you. But then actually what happens is when you're on your own and you've just got a small team, that short period of time can go a lot long, like, like, like can travel a lot more because when you suddenly want to go, okay, I'm going to go over here now and get shot and you can just move over the side of the room. Mm -hmm. You just do that. And five seconds later, you're ready to shoot it again. Whereas, you know, in a big film, when you go to the other side of the room, it can take an hour, maybe an hour and a half, because you've got to move every, all the set around, every, every, all the lights that were up have got to come down, all these lights have got to go up, all the grip equipment with the dollies and stuff has to move around. And, and a lot of the day, like you try, basically what ends up happening is you're, you end up playing this game where you're trying not to move too much, because the moves are what kills the day. Um, you're trying to keep it within a certain amount of moves. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that makes you have to think differently. A like, little bit. I, I, coming on a, on a set like that as a director, you learn quite quickly. You're like, oh, I have to, I have to direct differently. I have to run this to shoot differently to how I expected to. Well, there's two sorts of approaches, and we did both on Rogue One. One is um, like the classical way of 
directing, which is you sort of storyboard it, then you break the story. Look, you look at a plan mm -hmm. and you go, and I oh, sometimes you do this on the car on the way to the set. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and and so you go, these are the shots. You'd even figure it out on the set and work yeah, it out. Still at lunchtime sometimes about like, no. Sometimes that happens, yeah. and you go and you go. These are the shots. All right, look from above. That means. We'll probably get all these together, all these together, and all these together. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, it looks like three setups, and you'd show it the DOP and the assistant director. So do you agree? And they go, yeah, so this before lunch, then we break for lunch, we do this, that'll be about two or three hours, and then this, and that'll be the end of the day. Right. And then they keep you on schedule, like the, the AD will be there going, Gareth, we're going to make the day. If we're going to do all these shots, we have to think about going over there in about you know 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, And if you're behind, you have to make a decision like either hurry up or drop one of these shots that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of becomes the game for the classical way. The more indie way, um, we would try and do, film, like create sets that were 360 degrees so that, you know, and light it once, like not yep. have to keep changing the lights. Yep. And then be really organic, more like a documentary mind. Yeah, I, I also find as well, from my experience, that doing something like that helps performers more. That yeah. like they, they feel like they can be in that moment and no. you can just exist in that rather than being like, okay, we're going to do this this morning and we're going to do the other side of it in the evening. And it, right. it, it feels a little bit sort of like that feels a little bit more challenging. And sometimes I, I like to just like do the same thing. I'm just being like, right, okay, we're going to light this once <laughs> and just do it for every angle. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you find that that's a, a, a simpler thing as well, like for the actors? It, I mean, at this level, you've got the best actors in the world. Of course. So you're kind of fine. But when All I did the people my... who work with me need to step it up. That's what they need to do. Yeah, or have really big heads. Yeah. It really helps because mm -hmm. they can be further away from camera and still look good. And so we, we my, the first film I ever made was this very low budget film. Mm -hmm. And we had everybody apart from the two main actors were real people we met. Yep. So they weren't actors at all. Mm -hmm. and I found you could get really good performances out of them um, because everyone would win an Oscar for playing themselves, mm -hmm. right? No one can play you in your biopic better than you can. So mm -hmm. as long as you don't tell them to be anybody other than themselves, they're going to be fine. Yep. And so we would film and I would be really careful not to tell them what to do. Because the second I would say, every single time I'd say, could you just pick up that guy? Could you say this? Could you look that way and do that? Oh, they'd, it'd be really bad. Yeah. And it'd ruin it. Uh -huh. And so it's like, okay, don't tell them what to do. Don't tell them what to do. Just have conversations about why we're here and what we're trying to achieve. And, and then let it happen. Mm -hmm. And so you'd, you'd give them some little information and then you'd let it unfold. And it wouldn't be what, the, the dialogue wouldn't be what I was picturing, but it'd be real. And that's all I really cared about when I was yeah. making that. I think that that's, that's definitely something I struggle with, is being like going to set with like an idea in my head of what it should be. And then when it doesn't turn out like that, I go, oh, no, that's not exactly how it, like, I, I try and express how it is in my head. And you're right, it becomes a lot more robotic. Like even if right. it's just like, can you come up the stairs and grip the banister halfway up? Right. Like that becomes like, oh, no, I have to do it. It just becomes like a, lo a lot more sort of thinking about it rather than just existing in that moment. I think that's, moment. that's definitely one on the learning curve for me when I was making films is to let go of that stuff because mm -hmm. you close your eyes and you picture a scene and just because you pictured it that way doesn't mean that's the way it should be. That's just something to have as a foundation. Mm -hmm. And then when all everything comes in front of the camera, what, I mean, my background was visual effects, like computer graphics. And so what you never get in computer graphics is happy accident. Everything is there because yep. you put it there. And you look at people who do great work, like I would look at my heroes that do beautiful illustrations and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you watch them work, they'd be grabbing images, sticking them on top, flipping them, stretching them, turning it around, inverting it, just trying to create problems for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you try, if you take a hammer and try and smash an idea, in that shattering, something will happen where you'll go, I wasn't thinking that, but I will love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so having something come in that wasn't what you were thinking, that kind of destroys what you were thinking, don't fight it, embrace it, and then try and find the good in it. Right. And, and it'll always be better for it. That's really interesting. And also what you just said there about the visual effects stuff and you coming from visual effects, working on something like this that obviously has a lot of visual effects elements to it. How was it directing something like that? That, that, that Not even scenes where you had lots of visual effects happening around actors, but sequences that were entirely computer generated. Like how, how was it to direct something like that? The computer generated stuff, ILM were really good in that what they helped me with was they would create for certain sequences. So for like at the end of the movie, there's the space battle and, you know, they're trying to get through the shield and then there's all the stuff that happens with the Star Destroyers and that. And for all of those sequences, they would they would mock up like sections of it as animation, like with a virtual. And I would stand in a virtual space 
which is pretty much like this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it sounds sophisticated, it wasn't. And it, I just had an iPad with, I don't even know the names of these things, but sure. it's one of those VR yeah, setups yeah, yeah, yeah. with the controller well, on you can it. just you can just look around. Yeah, and then they would, and then they would play the animation and it would be on loop. And so I'd just hang somewhere and try and get a shot. Oh, that didn't work. Try again. Oh, that was nice. Hang on. This is nicer, isn't it? Should I just try over here? No, that's right. nice. And you could just experiment and you'd have a whole day session um, in London, at ILM, and, and just explore this. And you'd end up with all this footage and you'd have to sit there and I'd go through and select the ones I liked and then just give it over to the editors and that's say, so and say just try and make something out of this. And what is your last question, actually? This, uh, I want to know, what, what is your relationship like it, with the editing? Because... Um, in my experience, I find that like that's where I find what it, you know, obviously that's where you find what it is, but it's where I really like find the language and the pace and the tone of, of, of what the thing is you're making. Because obviously when you're doing pre-production and post-production um, and, and production itself, that's completely necessary and obviously very important. But I find that in post is the place where you're really finding the thing that you, that you set out to make. Um, so what is your relationship with, with the post-production? And also, do you have a, a favorite out of the three? Editors. No, I, 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 three <laughs> oh, the three stages. Because we had three editors on the film. I was oh, like, right. I okay. can't answer that question. Who is your favorite editor? <laughs> um, the, I, I find um, my favorite is is the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the middle is is like a, a like a battle. Mm -hmm. like it's a it's, massive headache. It's Because if you had a graph of making a film, there's your aspiration at the beginning, how amazing it's all going to be. And as, as you start making it and filming, it, all the compromise comes in and everything gets worse and worse and worse and not as good as you wanted it to be. And then you hit get into post and you start to fix and fix all these things and it gets better and better. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate goal is to get close to or even better than what your original aspiration was. Mm -hmm. Typically you don't. Mm -hmm. And and so I love anything that's like a positive experience, which is like that climb back up as in, right, in, right. in edit um, is, is enjoyable. But um, but filming is, but actually no one else sees what's in your head. So no one else, like you'd finish a day filming and you might leave and be like, ah, oh, I didn't quite get that. And like, mm -hmm. and people next to you be like, what are you on about? It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm just seeing, like you saying, the guy with the banister, I'm, I'm thinking something that I didn't get. And so I'm disappointed I didn't get it. But everyone else didn't know mm -hmm. what was in your head. So they just saw what happened and they are really happy. And yeah, yeah, they've got nothing to compare it to. That what yeah. they saw was just enough and it was good enough. And that's kind of the... The, the, the curse of being a filmmaker is that you never experience it like anyone else does. And mm -hmm. so it's impossible to experience your own films. And so, you know, I look at, you know, the original trilogy and, you know, and George Lucas might be like, oh, I wanted to change this, I wanted to do that. And I totally understand. Did that. he? I don't know if he's ever expressed that. Before. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but I, I totally understand that point of view now. Um, yeah. I think they're brilliant. You don't need to touch them. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just the curse of being the filmmaker is you... You can't see them the way other people do. Yeah, and that I mean that's a good note to leave on that like you'll never be happy with what you make. Um, but you should do it anyway, um, because it's fun. <laughs> thanks very much for talking to me. Thank today. you, thanks a lot. Cheers, thanks. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know if you want to see more things like this that are very, very filmmakery specific. I'd happily do that. And also just so you know now. All of Jack and Dean of All Trades is out on full screen, so the link will be in the description to that. There's a one-week free trial. Please enjoy. I'm so proud of it. Yeah.